Welcome to the Healing Pain Podcast with Dr. Joe Tata. Each week, we interview top experts in physical therapy, pain science, and integrative pain care. You'll learn the most up-to-date information for treating and reversing persistent pain. This podcast is for educational purposes only and not intended to be used as personalized medical advice. And now, here's your host, Dr. Joe Tata. Hey there, friends. Welcome to this week's episode of the Healing Pain Podcast. I am your host, Dr. Joe Tata. On today's episode, we're discussing the impact of the health insurance industry on the effective treatment of chronic pain. This is a topic I've been wanting to create some content around for some time now. When I look back at the evolution of the Healing Pain Podcast, the episodes typically fall into two buckets. I'm either talking about effective treatment, so trying to build awareness or spread awareness around conservative, effective treatments for chronic pain, or I'm talking about the latest or some new research that I feel is innovative. So kind of in those two, in those two buckets. I'm also always looking for where are the problems? Where are the problems and the barriers for us as professionals and obviously for people living with pain to access effective pain care? And when I look at the problems, there's one big problem that is kind of like a big flashing red light kind of the elephant in the room, and that's the health insurance industry. So before recording the introduction to this episode, I asked myself, how has this changed over the course of my career? So as a physical therapist, I started practicing or treating patients in 1997. In 1997, I really can't think of too many barriers for me treating a patient. So when I say that, I'm really talking about how much it costs a patient to access conservative pain care? And then is that treatment covered? Those are really the two big issues. How much does it cost? And is it covered? I can tell you back in 1997, I don't remember any patient having a deductible, which we'll talk about in a moment. And if there was a copay, it was something kind of moderate, like maybe five or $10. Now I'm not saying as citizens, professionals, as people living with pain, that we shouldn't be fiscally concerned about the delivery of healthcare, because that is important, especially in the United States of America. However, I can tell you today in 2021, the average American contributes to their health insurance, meaning there's typically an employee portion. So each month as an employee, contribute to your monthly premium. There's also an annual deductible. And then there are copays on top of all that. So as people in the United States of America, and this may be most important for those of us who live in the United States, but I know this impacts all of us around the world, is we're paying a lot of money into our health insurance. So we have to ask the question, what are we getting back? What is the benefit that we're receiving? Now, the average deductible in New York City, the place where I live, is somewhere between $5,000 and $10,000 for a family plan. I've seen family plan deductibles upwards of $20,000. So it's clear that premiums have increased. The second thing for us to consider are copays. Again, when I first started in 1997, copays were maybe five or $10. It's not uncommon now. I've actually seen copays that equal the cost of the PT visit. So copays are anywhere between 40, 50, 60, 70, upwards to of $100 to receive physical therapy care. So we're paying more. However, at the same time, I've also seen visits decrease. Currently in the United States of America, depending on the diagnosis, and this of course varies depending on the diagnosis and depending on where people live, but the average length of stay for a PT session is about 12 visits. So consider you have to treat someone who has fibromyalgia, and you only have two visits per week for six weeks for a total of 12 visits before the insurance company basically terminates care. So effectively, what large insurance companies have done is they have contracted or hired third-party medical management companies, which come in and it's what they call, they manage health insurance claims, which I kind of would like to just call it what it is. They aggressively deny claims for conservative care. This includes things like physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech, mental health services, as well as addiction treatment. And not only do they manage that care, but oftentimes 
insurance companies will not approve a patient seeing multiple providers. So for example, it can be very challenging or insurance companies often regulate if a patient is seeing both a physical therapist and a chiropractor or a PT and an OT, any combination of those, they don't like when patients are using their insurance to the fullest extent. Now let's carry that over into what is identified as the gold standard for the treatment of chronic pain, which is multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary care. That's when the patient is able to access multiple providers. In the United States of America, we have one interdisciplinary chronic pain clinic for every million people. One clinic for every million people that's interdisciplinary that focuses on chronic pain manager. Why do we have that? Because insurance companies have identified this as expensive care. It's too expensive to pay multiple providers at the same time. And they have severely cut back on those programs, probably since the early 80s somewhere. That's when kind of that trend started. Now, that has come back somewhat, but we really haven't seen a revitalization of interdisciplinary chronic pain treatment programs in the United States of America, specifically because insurance companies won't pay for the care. And then last, I don't want to just focus on private health insurance companies. In the United States, we have things like Medicare and Medicaid, which are government-sponsored plans. Those two have been cut every year, it seems. There are emails that go out by organizations such as the American Physical Therapy Association, and it's called Stop the Cut. That's where the Medicare fee schedule is reduced. So each year or every couple of years, the national government tries to reduce payments to outpatient physical therapy services. And when payments are reduced, it often has an impact on the number of visits that we can see patients for and the quality of care that we can provide in an outpatient setting. So the question today really is, how does the health insurance industry perpetuate the chronic pain crisis? Joining me today is Dr. Michael Chapman. Michael is a clinical psychologist who spent the last 32 years working in multidisciplinary chronic pain management. He is currently on the teaching faculty of the Department of Public Health and Community Medicine at the Tufts University School of Medicine in Massachusetts and serves as Director of Research and Network Development for Boston Pain Care. Dr. Chapman has authored more than 100 journal articles and book chapters on chronic pain management and lectures regularly at the international level. He's also the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Pain Research. On today's episode, we're going to talk about the health insurance industry and how it impacts the treatment of chronic pain. This is an important episode. Make sure you share this with your friends, families, and colleagues all over social media so we can raise awareness on this topic. Okay, let's begin and let's meet Dr. Michael Chapman. Hi there, Michael. Welcome to the Healing Pain Podcast. It's a pleasure to have you on this week. Uh, hi, Joe. Thank you very much for inviting me. I'm excited about being part of this wonderful podcast. I came across your research a couple of weeks ago, and I like your research because it's quite bold and around an important topic. So you were definitely someone I wanted to reach out to and interview and share your information, your perspective. I think it's vitally important in, of course, the United States of America and with regard to pain populations. Um, just give us like a little bit of, of course, I read your bio ahead of time, but you're a licensed psychologist. You do a lot of research now and you're the editor of a journal, but give us kind of just a simple backstory on where you came from and where you are today. Well, it's interesting. I can go back to college where I studied political science way back when, late 70s, early 80s at Columbia, and then ended up going into psychology and behavioral medicine specifically. And I was introduced to back pain at the Texas Back Institute in the mid-80s, and I've done nothing but pain work since. However, after spending many years solely as a clinician and someone who developed and ran an interdisciplinary pain program in Pennsylvania for 16 years, I started seeing that there were a lot of ethical problems in chronic pain management in particular. And I went back into my ethical philosophy, poli sci days, and started writing and put out a book, Ethical Issues in Chronic Pain Management. And that was sort of my jumping off place into academia. So I've been kind of a double agent over the last 15 years, spending time in patient care directly, but also spending time as a lecturer and policy writer, and now clinical pain researcher. So I do a lot of things, none of them well, but I definitely do a lot of things, as my publication record seems to suggest. 
Yeah. It's a good segue to where we are here today, talking about health insurance, the health insurance industry, and how that impacts populations of people with chronic pain. How did that become a focus for you? It became a focus for me when I saw that ultimately around 2004, 2005, my last years at the pain clinic in Pennsylvania, that insurers were no longer terribly interested in paying for an interdisciplinary pain clinic. It was a six-week, 35-hour-a-week program that was truly interdisciplinary, including physicians, psychologists, physical therapists, occupational therapists, vocational counselor, biofeedback therapists, nursing, nutrition, where basically we're teaching uh, patients with intractable chronic pain how to self-manage their pain and get back to work and have productive lifestyles and quality of life. And insurers, even though the data that come from companies, uh, countries that have national health services show that it's extremely cost effective as well as clinically effective. The insurers know that the average American switches insurance carriers about every three years. And rather than putting an investment into a labor intensive program, they will start off by saying just prescribe medications. And that didn't lead anywhere real good. And so this is what year? This is occurring in your mind? This is 2000? 2005 was when I really started to see it. And we've gone from over a thousand interdisciplinary pain programs in this country in 1999 down to about 90, 2012, when I wrote an article for the International Association for the Study of Pain. And our last count, there's 38 of these programs left, though most of them are carve outs, meaning that insurance will pay for services and not for others. The gestalt of the program is lost and the outcomes are pretty pitiful compared to those that we used to see for years and years. Right. So from the late 90s to 2005, let's say these programs shrank. So the number of interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary pain programs shrank, meaning like when we think about this and well, I guess my first question is, the data you have, does it include the VA system as well, or we're just looking at private insurance programs? That is looking at the VA data as well. Jennifer Murphy, the chapter on interdisciplinary pain management, the most recent edition of Bonica's Management of Pain, I asked her to co-author it with me. I'd written the previous one solo, but she's running interdisciplinary pain management for the VA system. But even those are now carve-outs because the VA doesn't want to spend the money it's necessary. And even though Jen is doing some great, great work, three hours, three days a week at most of the programs that do exist, and I think there's about 20 of them in the country, is certainly insufficient. And if you're not in a certain catchment area, you're not going to get into the program. And recently reviewed an article looking at outcomes that were less impressive. So the question is, why did they shrink so much? They shrank because, as I said, they were expensive. I mean, I moved to Seattle in 2005. A couple of years later, they shut down the first interdisciplinary pain program, which was one that John Bonica and Bill Fordyce and a handful of others started at the University of Washington. And that program at that point, I think in 2007, it was about $30,000 for a four-week program. And it was a spectacular program, no question about it. But they decided that, I'm not sure if it was not making money or losing money, but they decided it was not consistent with the mission of the hospital. And curiously, they took that space and they set up cosmetic plastic surgery booths. That's very profitable. profitable. So it really comes down to dollars and cents and the bottom line of insurers, cost containment and profitability of the business ethic and that collides with medical ethics and certainly with the concept in which I believe, which is pain management as a fundamental human right. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about a lot of those topics, but I just want to kind of balance these two ideas and concepts we're talking about. So you'd mentioned earlier that interdisciplinary pain management has research around it that says that it's cost effective, but yet four weeks of treatment, and I'm assuming that's inpatient treatment you're talking about? or daycare? That's outpatient. So that would typically be 
35 to 40 hours a week. There's only a small handful of programs that are inpatient still existing. The one at the Tampa Haley VA that Jen runs, but that's the only one in the VA system that's now for an inpatient program. I believe that inpatient programs are still available at Mayo Clinic, at Cleveland Clinic. And these programs were particularly important as inpatient entities because part of the goals of these programs was to gradually taper people off their opioids. That made a lot of sense, reducing opioids while giving patients other tools to independently self-manage their pain. But they stopped paying for inpatient quite a while ago. And how certain programs are able to maintain inpatient presences, I'm not exactly sure, because that makes it even more effective. But the program that I ran for years in Pennsylvania that I started back in 1989, and I still do some consulting with them, they're still up and running and alive. And when I left, it was a 35 hour week program, and we could only treat 12 patients at a time. And we had many, many personnel, highly skilled, you know, not kids right out of school, but seasoned therapists of various types, and they don't come in expensively. So we can only treat that small number of patients. These programs are not particularly profitable, to say the least. Right. So you have this kind of dynamic happening of the program is not profitable and it's expensive for someone to go through a 30 hour program four days a week. But I guess really what you're saying when you look at the research is that it's more expensive to have someone living with chronic pain, potentially disabled on the greater healthcare system than that $30,000 that's being spent for the four-week program. That's correct, which is why the European Union countries and the UK, they've been growing their number of programs because they own the patient's healthcare, including their pain care for life. And they're also interested in seeing them get off of say, any kind of disability compensation. But if you're an executive with a for-profit health insurance entity and you're insuring me and I happen to be on social security disability, that doesn't affect your thinking in any way, shape, or form. But in the more civilized countries, there's responsibility for the citizen citizenry and We just don't have that in the United States. It's capitalism gone rogue. Right. So there's a disconnect between someone being on disability, social security income, not having a job, not being a productive member of society, so to speak. The insurance company doesn't necessarily take that into consideration because they're a publicly traded company. Right. Right. And a publicly traded company, their main objective is profitability, correct? That is correct. And I've had discussions with the medical directors of these companies, and they've said, we have no fiduciary obligation to our enrollees whatsoever, our sole fiduciary obligations to our shareholders. And when that individual said that, and I kind of looked into his eyes and I was like, you didn't really just say that, did you? And then, you know, I repeat this years and years later, but if you look at the CEO salaries and bonuses, they have really gotten out of hand. I think 2016, I may be off by a year, for example, where United Healthcare CEO made $66.1 million, as reported in the mainstream media. Yet, as a clinician trying to get an 11th and 12th session of physical therapy in the calendar year for a patient that had multiple pain generators was almost impossible. Mm-hmm. Yet the CEO is making $66.1 million. Right. So the fiduciary responsibility is to the shareholders, the people who purchase the stocks, in essence, versus the person who has the insurance card in their back pocket. Correct. And the people who are insured, the enrollees, they've become fungible. They've lost all their meaning and all of their value to society. And good programs, including the one that I'd started in Pennsylvania, we returned 85% of our patients year after year to work. Mm -hmm. And if you look at programs now, a lot of them won't even have a vocational component. 
Mm-hmm. The goal has shifted from getting them back to being contributing members of society to just getting them off their opioids. And the reason that that's happened is that the insurers understand that with chronic opioid therapy, there are a lot of comorbidities and that these comorbidities are expensive to treat. Mm -hmm. So they've shifted their thinking and their messaging from just give them medications to no, 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 don't give them medications because of the research that has shown the great, great expenses associated with dealing with the comorbidities. And certainly the development of dependence and opioid use disorder, that's only the tip of the iceberg because there are other comorbidities associated with chronic opioid therapy. I'm not anti-opioid. I'm not one of the pro-opioid people either. I'm pro-patient. And I believe that opioids need to remain part of the chronic pain management armamentaria with certain patients for whom there are no other options. But as insurance pays for less and less and less, and interdisciplinary care, coordinated care has gone by the wayside, I think that opioids will continue to be important if we didn't have state legislation and such that turns doctors into criminals for prescribing. So if a patient wanted to piece together their own interdisciplinary pain team, so to speak, could they successfully do that within the constraints of the insurance system today? That's an outstanding question, Joe. I think that most patients will look at your discipline, physical therapy, if I can divulge that. And a lot of physical therapists like seeing young, athletic, in-shape individuals with acute injuries, and you kind of see them twice a week for a month to give them their exercises and they're better, they go home. The amount of physical therapy generally needed for someone with severely chronic pain coming from multiple generators is a lot more than would be needed for someone with typical post-injury acute pain. I, I'm in physical therapy like every five years, I ding myself up skiing or running or doing whatever I'm doing. And I'm in, I'm out and I'm old. So it's a different paradigm. And I think it'd be very hard for a patient to piece it together. The other thing that's important in regard to your question, Joe, is the distinction between interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary. And we have a system that is into multidisciplinary, meaning they see a lot of different disciplines, but not in a coordinated fashion. Rather, we do sequential care. So you're my primary care physician. I come in with chronic pain. You'll start me on some kind of medication. I may come back a month later saying, ah, it's not helping. You may say, well, I don't know if I want to go to opioids or increase the opioids you're already on. Let's send you to physical therapy. But when physical therapy, I'm not doing real well because I'm not totally adherent. And I've got a lot of emotional sequelae to my chronic pain condition. I'm not necessarily trusting. So you kick me back to the PCP, the primary care physician, and say, well, that didn't work. Well, let's get some injections and let's send you to a pain specialist. And then it's one, two, three epidural steroid injections and you're out. The American society is fixated with the number three. So if it's baseball, three strikes, you're out, the Holy Trinity. I've not quite figured this all out. But a big complaint of primary care physicians that I train in pain management these days is when I send to a specialist, they never touch the medications. And I know physicians that I've worked with who, when I call them up and say, yeah, this patient needs this, needs that, and we need an antidepressant on board, and we need consideration of a therapeutic level of a gabapentinoid. Uh, they go, oh, no, call the primary care. We don't do medications at our practice. So they do the things that are the gravy in many cases, and they don't get into the holistic treatment, overall treatment of the patient with pain. And then after the injections don't work, the physician may say, well, this person needs to go see a shrink. 
Then they sent them to a psychologist. There's a shortage of pain psychologists in this country. They're, when I left Seattle in 2017, my partner, my practice, and I were the only trained pain psychologists in private practice. So plenty on the other side at BU who are academicians and great researchers, some of the best, but because they were doing a lot of grant writing, and bringing in tens of millions of dollars, a lot of them are not even allowed to see patients, much less want to see patients. So this is why I'm engaged in the project now with North Carolina State University. And we start this week with the first pain clinical social work program in the history of the country, because we need to provide good mental health pain treatment, behavioral treatment of chronic pain, which is very, very hard to find. And even a lot of university pain treatment centers are unable to find that. And I'm talking about some well-known universities. Too. Yeah. When you're really talking about stepped care, like in that whole story, you mentioned that there's a steps of different care in there. And I think a lot of times now, a couple of steps are just traversed in one shot. Try physical therapy. That doesn't work. Or right to injection, so to speak. There are definitely pieces in there. In your research and working with insurance companies and working with these interdisciplinary treatment centers, how do we start to free ourselves from where we are currently? That's going to be very difficult, Joe. One of the problems is, as I see it, that we're the only industrialized nation in the world without a national health service. Mm -hmm. And even though we spend twice as much per capita as any country in the world, healthcare, including pain care, we rank number 37 in the world between, I think it's Cuba, then a country whose name I can't even pronounce. And a big part of that is access to care. So what we have right now is a system where not only is the insurance industry, but the hospital corporation industry, which is very, very rich, very, very powerful, are sucking up the resources that should be available for healthcare, certainly for pain care. And this is a problem that we're having. And I spend time every year um, in Europe, at least one occasion lecturing my Italian colleagues and my British colleagues and my Belgian colleagues, Spanish colleagues. And they point out that we're barbaric in that we just don't care about our people and we care about capitalism's good and anything else, you know, socialized stuff Bernie Sanders wants is very bad. And I'm not a communist, mind you. You know, I like being able to live in a nice condo in Boston, and I like being able to send my son to college at NYU. And I like being able to drive a nice car. But certain things are commodities, healthcare, pain care. Again, as Drs. Brennan and Carr and Cousins wrote in 2007, these are not commodities. These are fundamental human rights. Mm -hmm. And unless we get the extraneous resource-sucking players out of the game, as has every other civilized country in the world, I see very little hope for healthcare generally, and including pain care. But again, our system is clever in that we've discovered that it's much more profitable to treat disease than to prevent it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, prevention. I mean, the first step really should be promotion of pain care. That's really the first step in the entire step system that you're talking about. First step is health promotion. And actually Correct. that health promotion actually continues through every step. Yes, I agree completely. But, but there's little know, room in our current system, the way it's set up. Are there other models in the United States of conditions that were problematic at one point and have changed or we found solutions to changing them that we could follow in pain care to help improve it? None of which I'm aware, Joe. I think there are conditions that are treated much more effectively than chronic pain, but chronic pain is such a complex condition. It's not something that affects you just physically, but something that often affects you vocationally, legally, recreationally, socially, sexually, spiritually, emotionally, just so many different dimensions of one's being. 
are affected by chronic pain, which I consider a disease of the person. And to throw simple solutions at complex problems is clearly a sign of simple minds. But again, I guess it is simple minds that look at just the profitability of an approach. And that's what's happened. So again, I don't want to sound like the Che Guevara of pain medicine, but I think it's absolutely necessary. And this is why pain care in our country is so woefully poor. So if we take it out of the healthcare spectrum and stop looking at it as a disease and start to look at it as a human rights issue, it puts it into a completely different context in a way. Are there right. human rights movements that we could potentially lean toward and lean on with regard to chronic pain? That's interesting because, for example, the American Disabilities Act attorneys and the ACLU seem to be not particularly interested in the plight of chronic pain patients. And again, we've spoken to these groups about that since the opioid pendulum has swung from the indiscriminate prescribing of 15 years ago to frank opiophobia and oligoanalgesia today, and the fact that so many Americans with chronic pain are killing themselves daily. Just within the VA system, I believe it's 21 veterans commit suicide a day. And the VA has acknowledged that the majority of them suffer from chronic pain. Mm -hmm. So if we extrapolate out from there into the non-VA, I think we're potentially talking about many hundreds of suicides being committed by undertreated chronic pain patients every day, whereby the oligoanalgesia was at least a part of the reason for the suicide. But how do insurers respond to that? Well, that's one less expensive patient. Mm -hmm. I wrote an article with Lynn Webster, a past president of the American Academy of Pain Medicine, and we published it in 2015 on insurance's refusal to pay for abuse to term formulations of opioids, which continues to this day. And we went as far, and we got a little bit of heat for this, but we went as far in the article as to state insurers would rather see a patient who's expensive to maintain expire as opposed to having to pay for their, again, very expensive treatment on a long-term ongoing basis. So it's absolutely perverse in many of our eyes. But my hope is that this current administration, that we can get to them once COVID is brought under a modicum of control and help elucidate the problem, the chronic pain crisis that we're in right now, whereby we have 50 million chronic pain patients in this country, and by conservative estimated, 20 million of them have high impact chronic pain. But a progressively lower percentage of these patients are able to access opioid, opioid analgesia. And they're likely too far gone to benefit from some other treatments. What do we do to them? Or what do we do with them? I think by doing nothing with them, we're essentially killing them. And patients are really angry. Go on to social media. It's absolutely crazy. Yeah. We know that well here because our community talks about those things, both the practitioners and people with pain who follow this podcast. So we know the challenges here. I always take a curious stance toward things. And I try to see all sides of the, of the picture because I think when you keep a flexible perspective on different things, there might be some answers, not the complete answer, but there might be some inroads to things. What about technology? Could technology help with reaching people and could it be a less expensive alternative? Well, I think there's encouraging evidence from COVID that telehealth works largely. Telemental health has been wildly successful. I think those of us in the field of mental health or fields are anxious that plug is going to be pulled on remote therapy. I still treat about half a dozen patients remotely. And right now, insurers are happy to pay for it. I think there's in most states, the uh, government edict that they will have to pay for it. But if that goes away, then 
where are people who are in underserved areas going to get their care? The answer is they're not going to get the care. You know, this country is still a heavily rural one. And, and people living in rural areas are more susceptible to chronic pain due to the type of work that they've done. But again, no one really seems to care. The technology is good and is important, but I think that it's not going to be quite the game changer. If you can access a pain psychologist, you can get good quality care via you know, Zoom or whatever other medium. But how do you get diagnostic imaging? How do you get injections, therapeutic injections when injections are necessary? Are you going to be the physician saying, okay, Michael, now take the syringe and put it right about the, yeah, yeah, not going to work. And unfortunately, one of the most successful treatments for chronic pain out there, which are routine hip and knee replacements, went by the wayside for quite a long time because they were considered non-essential surgeries and rehabilitation had its problems because physiatrists who were pain management specialists were pulled from pain management into the rehabilitation of enfeebled, deconditioned individuals who'd been vented and had survived COVID, but needed a, a great amount of attention. Yeah. So I don't think another pandemic is the answer to our problem. What about cross-training licensed health professionals? So we see a major trend in physical therapy for psychologically informed physical therapy. So that's combining some of the principles of cognitive approaches with obviously the already established principles of physical approaches as a way to might save money, might add professionals to the community who can help people. It's good to see that in doctor physical therapy programs that so many of them are focusing on behavioral patient management in the curricula. I can tell you that physical therapist who took over my program in Pennsylvania, she's a DPT. She's a much better psychologist than I ever was. But I think interdisciplinary care is a good training ground for cross-disciplinary training in pain medicine. So it's a good point that you make, and I'm just not sure what the future is going to hold. You can be trained in behavioral management, but can you bill for it? Mm -hmm. You know, as long as the insurance carrier is saying what you can and cannot bill for, then you're not going to be likely to provide the service that may be the best interest of the patient. You're going to provide what you get paid for, what puts food on your family's table. It's the norm. Yeah, there, there are restrictions to insurance companies. Some of them have restrictions to billing and things like that. So what you're saying is the coding is what dictates the care at times, not what the patient actually needs, basically. And certainly not the clinical evidence basis. I mean, right. I'd cite a lot of physical therapists, particularly in other countries, who provide behavioral health care routinely because their National Health Service says, yes, you're trained, you can do it and they get some incredible results. Mm -hmm. But that's not the way it is in this country, as long as profitability and cost containment are, are really the mantras. Yeah. Although I do know many physical therapists who have found ways around that and are creative with regard to their evaluation and treatment planning, which is what we need more and more creativity. Because sometimes if we wait for the system to change, it actually might not change. We may have to find creative ways to negotiate around the system, so to speak as at the same time we begin to change the system. If you had a magic wand and you could wave it, what would you do to repair our healthcare system for people living with pain? Well, I try to educate state legislatures that are passing draconian laws and state medical boards, which never include any pain specialists, so that physicians and other clinicians who are willing to take on the challenge of patients with chronic pain are not punished for doing so. And we have a very, very unhealthy climate right now. And that's being pushed by states. Everyone wants to blame the 2016 CDC guideline for primary care physicians, but it's not the guideline itself, but the weaponization of the guideline. 
Mm. That was so problematic. I think that this was already beginning to happen before the guideline was published. I was on the 2015 Washington State Opioid Guideline Writing Committee. I was the one dissenting vote and certainly the only psychologist and I think the only non-physician on the Guideline Writing Committee. And unfortunately, that same group from PROP, uh, Physicians for Responsible Opioid Prescribing, which is centered in Seattle, they from there went to the federal level and put out the state of the uh, federal guideline, the CDC guideline, which has been so badly weaponized. And I think that was the intention of many of the members of PROP because my research will show I'm a huge fan of opioid sparing, but to some of these people, just the most severe members, the answer is opioid eradication, not opioid sparing. And it's ugly. So if I had a magic wand, long answer, I'm all over the place with it, but I'd kind of tap society on the head and say, okay, let's stop the lying. The lying is bad. Insurers do not talk about concern about patients and have policies that belie that. Anti-opioid zealots don't throw out rhetoric and hyperbole, which just kills patients and makes doctors fearful of prescribing. And then the pro-opioid zealots that are on, including physicians, and it's always physicians who've lost their licenses to practice, and they sit there on Twitter and say, Opioids are the only real answer for chronic pain. And if I publish spinal cord stimulation research, which I do in the United States and through my Italian team, they all of a sudden become a methodology experts and say, oh no, that's garbage research. And I'm like, we're publishing it in journal of pain research and neuromodulation, you know, high impact factor journals that don't accept many articles. What makes it garbage? And then they come up with, well, it's garbage. And I will ask, where did you do your research methodology training? Well, everyone knows that. And then patients will chime in. Well, I read on Google that. And we just have to stop the garbage. The misinformation out there is killing patients. And I'm working on an article right now, an editorial with a primary care physician who's leaving primary care as soon as she finishes up law school about the fact that both sides of the opioid argument just lie blatantly and feel very comfortable in doing so. Mm-hmm. They pull a Donald Trump and they create data that just doesn't exist. And they find a small 1989 study that shows it was done by polling, right, with selection bias and response bias that couldn't be published anywhere these days. And they say, see, this is proof. And I just want to shoot them, shoot myself. I all of a sudden become a firearm advocate when I see this stuff. So if I had a magic wand, it would be the truth-telling wand. And I spend time on Twitter where I can be found at HeadDoc, it's H-E-A-D-D-O-C-K, very controversially calling out people on either side that lies, that does not follow an evidence basis, that's agenda-based and is killing patients because patients don't want to get any injections. They're all bad. No, they're not all bad. Don't want to get spinal cord stimulators because they kill you. Well, when they look at research in the 1980s and you had these spinal cord stimulators that were tonic, that were not high frequency, not burst stimulation, they were not effective. And they're also about the size of my head Mm. that would be implanted in people. And these caused a lot of problems, but I've seen great technological advances in spinal cord stimulation and great outcomes. And yet when the people are saying opioids and opioids alone will help you, actually, that sounds like something President Trump said, I and I alone can help you. I think there are his words, but it's just disingenuous. And it's persuading patients from rejecting good quality care. A very good example would be ERIS protocols, enhanced recovery after surgery. And the guru at this, Ed Mariano out at Stanford, and I wrote an article late in 2019 pointing out ethical ERIS protocols exist, and they should be opioid sparing. It's a good thing. But opioids cannot be taken off the table postoperatively because some patients will not respond well to ERIS protocols, and they will hurt. 
and it's inhumane to deprive them of post-op analgesia. But as a result of some medical centers doing this, patients are afraid to go in for elective surgeries, Mm -hmm. including a routine hip or knee, which may solve the problem to begin with. Crazy making. One of the ways that we see we can confront this challenge, and as you mentioned, it's multi-level, is health promotion. So a lot of what we do here is a public service announcement, which begins to educate people. And I think we're educating, obviously, people with pain, practitioners, heck, maybe even someone listening from an insurance company or a business who's self-funding their insurance for employees who have an interest in this. And I really think that the health promotion aspect, if we can tweeze that through that step from basic education, primary pain medicine, which really includes primary care providers, PTs, chiropractors, up through specialist care, and then finally interdisciplinary care, then we'd be in a better place than we are. And we need a lot of advocacy for patients. I don't think we advocate enough for patients. I know the average clinician probably would say, well, I do this every day by going to work. And I don't think that's enough actually for the type of problem we have. I think the advocacy has to kind of spill over outside the clinic into other areas to improve this. You know, there are a lot of patient, pain patient advocacy groups out there. The best of them by far is founded by Penny Cowan, who's in the original first class of the Cleveland Clinic's interdisciplinary pain program under Ed Covington. So she, in 1979, founded the American Chronic Pain Association. And that's just a great, great educational organization for advocacy. But if you go on Twitter, you see these groups that are like fleecing patients of their money. And you see these people who run them like living high in the hog at, at major conferences on the nickels and dimes that patients can send in. And they don't advocate for pain care. They advocate for unfettered access to opioids. Right. And that's not the answer either. Right. Yeah. That's a good point. They, they do. Michael, it's been a pleasure chatting with you. Of course, everyone can go on to PubMed and find Michael Chapman's information. And you can reach out to him on Twitter. His Twitter handle is HeadDoc, which is pretty easy. HeadDoc. HeadDoc with two Ds. Yeah. HeadDoc. Okay. With, yeah. We're going to link to it so you have it on the show notes. I want to thank Michael for being on the Healing Pain Podcast this week and talking about the challenging topic of the intersection between quality pain management and cost containment from publicly traded insurance companies. Make sure to share this information out with your friends and colleagues, of course, with practitioners and anyone who struggles with chronic pain. Make sure you go over to the Integrated Pain Science Institute and hop on our mailing list so we can send you the latest information each and every week. I'm Dr. Joe Tad. It's a pleasure being with you. We'll see you next week. for listening to the Healing Pain Podcast with Dr. Joe Tata. To subscribe to the podcast and learn more, visit integrativepainscienceinstitute.com. That's integrativepainscienceinstitute.com. Sign up to receive weekly updates, leave a review on iTunes, and share this episode with your friends.